Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Kerrigan. Well, welcome, welcome to Witch Talk. My name is Kerrigan, and today we have a very special guest, as all of our guests are special. Um, and uh, it's a very special interview also. Uh, we will go right away into the interview, um, and we're going to do uh, uh, a thorough analysis of the book and of the principles of the group that this guest uh, is part of. It's a very exciting interview, um, and uh, I'm very, very excited to be here to talk to you about this. Now, another thing that I wanted to tell you before we go to that is that um, you can watch the, the channel live on justintv.com. Um, uh, d not dot com dot tv and then slash Kerrigan and that's the only way that you can actually watch the show live um, for now we're hoping that YouTube decides to give us you know the um, broadcast uh, privileges and um, you can participate in the chat room so I wanted to welcome everyone on the chat room um, welcome to Witch Talk and please do questions if you have them and um, I'm sure that the guest will be more than glad to answer them now let's go into the interview and the introduction to our guest today here we go he is not a pagan, although he is pagan. He is not of the craft, although he is probably a witch. He is a pagan, as we all are, because nature is within us. He is probably a witch because a man, who had learned things from a woman long before the modern witchcraft began, passed what he'd learned unto him. He is a member and the leader of the Regency. He is the man who wrote that inheriting and continuing a witchcraft tradition, however, does not make one a witch. That lies in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guest today on Witch Talk. Author of Genuine Witchcraft is explained the secret history of the Royal Windsor Coven and the Regency, John of Monmouth. Hello, John. Welcome to Witch Talk. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Carrigan. Thank you so much for uh, for being here. It's a pleasure to have you and an honor to have you here. Now, uh, we're going to talk about uh, your book, uh, a book that you have, Genuine Witchcraft. It's explained the secret history of the Royal Windsor Coven and the Regency. Now, one of the first questions that I have for you is uh, something that you know people know about and talk about traditional witchcraft to talk about oh it's this is traditional. do you really define what you do I mean people have names for everything and tax for everything you know the Gardnerians the Alexandrians the eclectics this and that how do you define yourself do you really define yourself or what you do as traditional witchcraft not at all um. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, that's a very interesting sort of uh, <laughs> question. Uh, Ron White was very very careful um, when he was talking of uh, witchcraft and paganism and things like that, and he felt that the term witchcraft, certainly uh, in the, back in the sixties, was something that would uh, send people running away from uh, the group of, of the Regency. Um, Although elsewhere he does, on one occasion only, mention that the Regency has its roots in witchcraft. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as I say in the preface to my book, I'm not a pagan. I am pagan, and I think we all are. Um, I think it's it's that part of nature that is in all of us, and so 
and responding and regency is, is really about responding to the pagan in us rather than us being pagans or being part of a religion. Um, equally, um, I suggest that probably I'm a witch because in terms of general definitions, um, ideas that were passed on to me and practices um, that I've continued um, might identify me in that way to other people. Um, for me, it's, it's a, a lifelong task and perhaps at the end of that life I will become a witch. Yeah. So I'm saying that I'm neither a pagan nor a witch and I don't think that any member of the Regency would see them as either of themselves as either of those things, simply as members of the Regency. Yes, yeah. Now, what is the, the Regency and, and what is it? We know that it's, it's a group of people um, uh, and and Ron really didn't like the the definition of coven. I mean, it's just not you know he really didn't like that. He liked it a little bit more on the tribe or clan kind of. <laughs> he he chose his words very carefully, didn't he? Uh, he was very concerned about words and how to define things and how to say things. Now, uh, how would you define the regency itself, the group? <laughs> Ron described it uh, perhaps uh, at one point in time as, as an anarchic group, <laughs> um, a group with no leader um, that came together with a common sort of purpose, which was to um, celebrate the seasonal festivals. Uh, the Regency evolved. Um, initially, it began as, as a, a meeting point for um, members of covens. It was purely for witches and the idea was that by holding the uh, Regency's meetings at times when witches weren't otherwise occupied, in other words at the seasonal festivals rather than the lunar celebrations, um, that witches could come together, they could share ideas and, and that had been sort of an idea that had been around in the 60s and in fact Cochrane mentions it in his writing um, later on, uh, the, the Regency becomes more open. Um, it, it takes its celebration out of the drawing room um, into the woods. And at that point, other people, people passing by, join in. And it all seems a very good idea to have more and more people as members of the group. Um, at which point, uh, a number of people who had attended the meetings ceased to attend because they avoided, wanted to avoid publicity. Um, and in fact, the newspapers at the time uh, did do articles on them that named and shamed them as witches. Um, and, and so the Regency then sort of became, became sort of the very first sort of public <coughs> pagan celebration that was open to anyone to participate in. At that time, um, the Druids would hold meetings and people could be spectators. But you couldn't just turn up and join in, um, become part of it. And that continued, it continued in that form for quite a number of years. But progressively, the people who were attending um, knew each other more and more and there came a point when it was decided to it wasn't even a decision the group simply evolved into something that was more closed um, we ceased um, publicizing our meetings um, we developed a, a harmony a, a group mind and uh, and that was that, had, that was something that had eluded the group for a long, long time and, and had been its goal. Um, that group mind still persists, but in a much more diffuse form now. Um, we don't meet very often. Um, when we do, we're, we're always taken aback by um, 
by the power of of, of, of what we can do together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, it's, so it's changed. It's, it's it's an evolving thing, and, and will no doubt evolve in the future, perhaps gradually as we all die out. But. Uh, <laughs> Well, hopefully not. Hopefully, you know, <laughs> the group will continue as it well, should, you know. I, I know that, that Ron had, had sort of talked of uh, Regency groups uh, setting up up and down the country in the same way that uh, Roy Bowers had sort of, well, sorry, Robert Cochran had spoken of um, sort of having the, reviving the old religion. Um, mm -hmm. So whether the Regency has a future is, is uh, out there to be known <laughs> in that future, <laughs> certainly not now. <laughs> <laughs> now, all of these groups that are sprang out of this, um, uh, they are also called the Regency? No. Or they have their no. own names? Oh, okay. No, no. Um, each group that, 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 that sort of People who who were in the Regency sort of went into other groups. Mm -hmm. um, those groups were shaped by their experiences in the Regency. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I, I live in Cornwall, in the southwest of England, and certainly there are groups here that that uh, identify themselves as Regency-like. Um, there is, I understand, also a, a French Regency, um, but. But I have no con real contact with them. There's no um, influence over them. Um, but we, as an anarchic group, we don't have any um, texts, dogma, or anything like that that we can pass on to other people. Yes. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, this is important, John, because, you know, the reference that the audience now has, it's obviously of a Wicca or something that it's a little bit more uh, public. So when we talk about um, these groups and, and your group in particular, um, and when they don't have the same reference, uh, they have, you, you, you just said, you know, we don't really have any texts or things to pass it on there's no I don't have any contact so it's really a, it's wonderful for you to be explaining these things because um, it, it explains the nature of, of this particular type of, uh, of practice um, the other connection that I wanted to understand is w what is the connection between the Regency and Robert Cochran or who was known as Robert Cochran right that, that, that is itself is a very interesting question because had you asked uh, myself or any other agency member that question sort of a few years ago, um, the answer would have been we've no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you might then have sort of <laughs> perhaps told us a, a little bit about Roy Bowers or Robert Cochran, and we then might have made a connection with him. Um, uh, but there our interest would have ended. Um, I, I knew of Roy um, through George and Ron, uh, George Stannard and Ron White, mm -hmm. um, because they'd been part of the coven with him in the early 60s. And I knew very little more of him other than he committed suicide. Um, even today I have little interest or no real interest in Robert Cochran. Mm -hmm. um, and, th and that's posed a bit of a problem for the book because um, <laughs> there is a lot of interest, I understand, in Robert Cochran yes. and the amount of literature, uh, first-hand literature, that's available um, is very limited and I understand part of it is suspect. Um, and so the documents that I've produced or reproduced at the end of the book, um, I as far as I'm aware, almost double, if not the, the, the literature that's first hand literature that's available. And so people have taken it that this is a book about Cochrane. But in fact, it's not. It's, it's a book about the Regency. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, it, so it's become very difficult. And in terms of your question, what I, what I can say is that um, 
from my reading of, of, of these documents, um, Robert Cochrane met Roland George. He, his ideas seem to have come largely from Gardner, the Order of the Golden Dawn, Dion Fortune, the sort of standard sort of places at the time. And that he subsequently abandoned these ideas when he met Ronan George and Norman Gill um, in favour of their ideas. And that later on again, um, around 1965, when he's forming a new group around himself, when he's trying at, at some level to distance himself from Ronan George, he starts to add new ideas which are his own. And what then happens is that all of the ideas come together to create what's now called the Cochrane tradition. So, so the connection between the Regency and Robert Cochrane is there's a historical connection in the um, the two founding members of the Regency were also two of the founding members of the Royal Windsor Coven that Cochrane led. Um, Robert Cochrane also shared the ideas of those founding members and those ideas were carried forward both into the Regency and the Cochrane tradition. Um, whether Cochrane played a part in, in actually in the Regency itself is really a moot point. Mm -hmm. What he did was he brought energy to the ideas of the the other founding members of the coven. He, he, he was the, the driving force. But when you look at it, it always seemed to go in a different direction to that which they intended. Um, he seemed to have his own path and they had their path. And it was their path rather than Robert Cochrane's path that led to the Regency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all I can really say is a, a sort of summary of the situation. I think that, uh, and you, you, you talked about this in, um, in the, the Regency, Regency and the Cochrane Coven um, by you, that you actually wrote in um, ronaldchalkwhite.org.uk, which is a website that we can actually go. It, I really recommend everyone to go and read the texts. If you don't I mean, I really want you to buy the book because the book is absolutely fascinating, if not an item that even if you're not um, uh, inclined to follow or to be, you know, passionate about this path um, specifically, I think that it's a book that you should have because it tells you a lot of um, history, has a lot of documents, it has a lot of uh, specific things that are really clear. Um, it will clarify to you um, in a very interesting way how these things work on, on this particular work. So, um, Genuine Witchcraft is explained. Um, it's a book to buy, but if you don't buy the book, at least read the texts on the <laughs> website because they are really wonderful. And um, some of the texts actually on the website are on the book, or I should say some of the book are on the website. Uh, the website is called ronaldchalkywhite.org.uk and that's Ronald and then Chalky, it's C-H-A-L-K-Y and then white, like the color white. Everything together, ronaldchalkywhite.org.uk Now, um, this whole thing just to say that um, uh, it seems to me that this whole the, the whole experience of the Regency and, and then, you know, even in the early, you know, if we go back to um, the, the Windsor, uh, Royal Windsor Co Coven, it's, everything is very, um, uh, it's almost spontaneous. I mean, there are, there are guidelines, but everything is very spontaneous, individualistic, um, in in a group obviously you know in a group but as you as you talked about earlier uh, the group evolved the people in the group evolved. so you're always talking about people and the experience of people and we're going to talk a little bit more about what Ron said about this experience and the pursuit of truth and what is that but it seems very um, visceral all of this 
Do you agree? Yes, yes, very, very much so. Um, I, I, I think that uh, that that for people who who have an interest in the Cochrane tradition, um, that there will be ideas that that they will feel are very cerebral, others which are very visceral, mm-hmm. and and that. That, that in, in fact looked at more clearly the ideas, there are two disparate set of ideas in that Cochrane tradition mm-hmm. and I think that one of those sets of ideas, this visceral tradition, um, this, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, for example, <laughs> let me give you an example, I remember um, one Halloween um, going into the woods, and uh, the, the, the women went off um, down into what we called the dancing ground. And the dancing ground was um, a, a, a bare patch of land um, bordered by a, a very small stream, um, one which one could step across with relative ease. Um, and each of the men were, went down to this to meet the women in turn um, on their own and they went they were blindfolded um, and led to the edge of the stream um, they were then had a, a, a knife point placed on their chest and they were also their hands were taken and, and placed in raw meat <laughs> uh, <laughs> In the state of consciousness, and and this is the critical thing I think about the Regency and why it's visceral, in the particular state of consciousness, we were, each of us, quite honestly and openly accepting the possibility and at the same time fearing our own death in that moment. Um, It wasn't a game, it wasn't a play, this was real magical ritual transformation it, it it's just amazing because i really <laughs> what we know john and and you know the you know you have to, i i don't know if you if you know this probably you do but what we really do know um it's it's um a, a kind of a witchcraft and it's a little bit if if we go to the purists and we think if we go to uh, the Gardnerians or, or the Alexandrians or you know something that it's called traditional British witchcraft that the Americans call it that way I mean the English doesn't don't really fancy that term but that's another story completely and entirely <laughs> um, but you know if we go to this it's everything is very formal beautiful but formal um, you know the practices of Gardner all of us know you know uh, then you have Alex and Alex actually worked a lot outside you know you have a lot but it is also ceremonial a little bit of uh, you know um, so he distanciated himself from from Gardner in that aspect and he went outside now it was rare for you to actually I mean you you were outside except for one festival which was Candlemas right that's right yes. yeah yeah and and it's uh, all of the other festivals you were outside and to me it's amazing to to actually learn how and read this that you used the landscape and the forest and the woods as a medium almost like a mantra the labyrinth and and everything that you had in the landscape to attain altered states of mind and consciousness and it's uh, it's just it blows my mind it's it's really it's beautiful and at the same time it's absolutely genius it's um it's it, I, I couldn't only imagine you know <laughs> what it would be like you know um what, what what i can say is 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 in terms of following that seasonal cycle through in in that mm-hmm. kind of way um year in year out yeah, um, yeah meant that that one evolved one one 
grew more and more in touch with the nature that was within oneself. Yes. Uh, and the sense that, yeah, nature is within us and we're in nature. We are nature. Um, uh, and it brought us further and further into that connection, into the connection with, with some very basic fundamental energies. Um, that, that's why sort of we dealt with a very archetypal world because archetypes are before language. And I think that sort of high magic sort of stuff that you're talking about is, mm -hmm. is, is, is for language. It, it's not for the, the pre-verbal. <laughs> um, <laughs> the very primitive, what we were doing was very, very primitive. Now, w would you call this shamanic? I mean, would you define it as, I mean, we define it, we use the word visceral. Would you add uh, shamanic to that or not? I would, I would. I, I use that word within, um, within, within genuine witchcraft and alongside the, the sort of, uh, the, these were shamanic voyages. They were journeys in into the other world. And and when you go back and look at, at, at old Welsh myths, for example, then the journey into the other world and and the recovery of the the riches of that other world um, are part of that sh shamanic tradition. And and certainly, sort of, um, it for me as an individual, it's the whole process was accompanied by shamanic dreams um, yeah. which yeah. gave me this pseudonym John of Monmouth um, <laughs> <laughs> so so yes I, I, it, it is shamanic yeah, yeah. now uh, let me just make a little parenthesis here this is one of the questions that people ask me all the time and um, I would love you to answer it the best you can, and I know that we're going back again to Robert Cochran, but you know, that's, it that's is a, inevitable, sure. inevitable sometimes that we can, you know, uh, there's a lot of speculation about the reasons why um, Robert died uh, from belladonna poisoning at Midsummer of '66. Now, th for those who don't know, he did this. He he commits suicide by ingesting a long um a large amount of belladonna and he died because of that 66 is the date what is do you have a possible explanation for this because this was a suicide so it's not really oh oops we put it a little bit more that we should in the, you know in the chalice um it it was really something that it was it is it's said that it was uh, a suicide it, it, yeah, very, very sad, and uh, yeah. I agree. Yeah. There, there is a lot of speculation about mm. his death, um, and, and much of that speculation has been sort of asserted as truth. Yes, uh, and in a way, that's that does seem, from what I've discovered, uh, entering sort of the world of paganism and witchcraft, from which sort of we, 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 we were distant for many, many years. Um, actually seem to be par for the course. Um, I don't think you should suggest the truth unless you have the evidence to support it, yeah, which is why in, in genuine witchcraft is explained. I carefully put note of the source of every suggestion mm -hmm. with external reference, even where I had personal knowledge. Um, I wanted whoever was reading me to be able to make up his or her own mind. Um, on the basis of evidence that was easily accessible and identified in detail. I didn't want to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. I want them to make up their own minds about it. I didn't want to put in the vaguest of references in a bibliography or at the end of the book or at the end of each chapter. Um, simply because when I'm told a truth, I want the evidence. I want to make up my own mind, not have my mind made up for me. And so in that regard, um, I would defer <laughs> to Gavin Semple's The Poison Chalice, which is about Cochrane's death, which appears to be well researched. I certainly haven't researched into Cochrane's death. 
I was told that he committed suicide because he couldn't have the love of the woman he loved. Um, and I was told more. Um, there's a, a, a book that I, or a trilogy that I enjoy from Victorian times by a man called Edison. Um, it's called Fish Dinner in Memison, if anyone wants to read it. And there's a line in there that says, safer treat a goddess as a woman than a woman as a goddess. And I think that it's important in this context to keep in mind what Robert Cochrane himself wrote perhaps as a reminder to himself that because we can't comprehend pure energy we have to give it form and the danger then is that we can be taken in by those forms and treat others and ourselves as goddesses and gods and <laughs> I think that's what happened to Cochrane yeah yeah well thank you for the answer um, now uh, Let's go a little bit more about the origins of these rituals and where, I mean, you just touched it a little bit in the beginning, but tell us about the sources of the early rituals of the of the Royal Windsor Coven. Um, the early rituals are a composite of ideas that was provided by the original members of the coven mm -hmm. um, and also its initial guests. Um, the, <laughs> just as the Regency was open to anyone yes. um, in its earlier days was by invitation only so so the Royal Windsor Coven actually had guests right from the very beginning and in particular Norman Gills and his wife um, and so sort of his ideas can't be left out of the sort of the, the, the stewing pot um, some of the ideas would seem to have originated from in the ideas of Gerald Gardner and, and in High Magic. But other ideas are less easily traced. And it's those ideas that begin to dominate as the government sort of progressed. Um, and what's important about those ideas is that they gave rise to a ritual of an order of power that, that other people were clearly not experienced before. So Bill Gray comments on it, Doreen Valiente, Marion Green, and they all had considerable experience in magical groups. Um, as for the source, Robert Cochran says quite clearly that he wasn't the source of the ritual. Um, now that wasn't a ruse on his part to pass off his invention as something older, um, since one of the very early documents um, that's in the book um, Robert Cochran is writing to Ron White and enthusing that they've got hold of what appears to be the real tradition. Um, elsewhere he says that the ritual has two sources. The first is in Robert Graves' The Tree Alphabet. Um, and he in fact wrote to Robert Graves um, and told him that he had a friend who'd worked out the alphabet and all the evidence suggests that this friend was in fact Ron White and Ron White sort of had a very strong interest in Druidism when he first came to the coven. Um, the other source mm -hmm. according to Cochrane is a very old man and I, I devoted the entire chapter of the book to explore yes. who this old man was. <laughs> now, I know that it was George Stannard, but I lacked any external evidence for that. So what I had to do was to actually argue from the case of who the very old man was not. <laughs> and, and there's clear statements of evidence of ignorance of the ritual for the two main alternative candidates who are Norman Gills and Bill Gray. Um, so it's not very satisfactory, um, but that's where, I, that I think is, is sort of where that early source came from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I think that uh, it, it's very interesting because when we read your book and uh, if you came a little bit late to the show uh, live, we're talking uh, about uh, a book called Genuine Witchcraft. He's explained the secret history of the Royal Windsor Coven and the Regency. And we're talking with John of Monmouth, which is the author of the book, 
with Jillian Sprangs and Shani Oates also. And um, it's a little bit in there. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about the sources of the early rituals of the Royal Windsor Coven. Um, now, this is a ritual that all of the Wiccans, <laughs> or people that are connected with Wicca, or witchcraft, or whatever you want to call it, they know. When you say drawing down the moon, everybody knows what it is. Um, well, we hope so. But <laughs> drawing down the moon is one of the one of the rituals. That it's very popular. It was uh, something that Gardner had is in in his own practices. Alexandrians also have it, and um, eclectics also do it. Um, <laughs> But the ritual of the drawing down the moon of the of the Royal Windsor Coven is quite different from the one of Gerald Gardner. And um, what did Bill Ray said nor meant when he said they have all made the fat fatal mistake of believing that witchcraft was the relics of the fertility religion. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> As I say in the preface of my book, um, I've read very little about witchcraft. Um, I did read Gerald Gardner's Witchcraft today for, yes. the, for the purpose of the book. <laughs> and so, so I'm not really in a position to pass comment on the difference between Gardner's ritual drawing down the moon and those of the Royal Windsor Coven. Mm -hmm. Except to say that the first of the coven of drawing down the moon rituals appears to borrow heavily from Gerald Gardner and Gion Fortune. The second drawing down the moon ritual is clearly very different from the first. It's simpler, it's less religious. And I think that above all, and this leads on to that quote, it begins with a different place or state of mind. The quote you refer to, if I remember correctly, and, and as I mentioned before the program began, my memory isn't great, um, <laughs> I think was from a letter written by Robert Cochran to Bill Gray, um, and that it was that he was saying that they've all made the fatal mistake of believing that witchcraft was a relic um, of fertility religion. Whether he was correct in his assessment of what he called Gardnerian witchcraft, Again, is is out of out of the, the, my scope and interest. Um, but trying to make sense of of what that statement is saying, I think that, that later on in my book, I'm I try myself to make a distinction between play and magic ritual. And I think we touched on it a little while ago in in talking. Mm -hmm. um, not long ago, my wife attended uh, hand fasting. Um, I didn't attend, it was taking place indoors, and I, I, I felt uncomfortable with that as an idea. Um, but when she returned, she described the event to me and said that it was lovely. So I asked her in turn, well, had it been powerful? And she said it hadn't. And that, for me, is the distinction between play and magic ritual. The magic ritual is powerful and takes place in the context of powerful consciousness altering techniques. The hand fast she went to produced a change in consciousness because there was clearly a shift into a trance of love. She found it lovely. Um, but what was missing for me was any sort of mastery of consciousness altering techniques. So for me, a, a hand fasting should take place in the other world. And I think that what the quote is suggesting is that in this person's view, the Gardnerian ritual wasn't embedded in consciousness altering techniques and was therefore like a fertility play. Um, so, so, that, so for me, that's what the difference is. That's what he said, yeah, and, and what, what it meant, yeah. Indeed, yeah. 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 Now, uh, there is another ritual that I never heard about it until I read your book. Um, and and it's, it's really, I mean, it might be ignorance of my part, probably it is, but um, it's a very interesting ritual that I would like you to, to explain to us. 
it, it's uh, was was the ritual of the broom and the sword. It, you know that that is the ritual that I'm referring to. What is what is the impo what is it first of all, and why was it so important for for the rituals of the of that particular group? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, it might be. <laughs> when you when you say that uh, you you'd not heard of it, um, very early on when I I I raised it with. A group of people who were attending a, a conference um, at the Museum of Witchcraft yes. uh, down here in Cornwall, and uh, in fact, none of them—they were all widely read um, and knowledgeable <laughs> about the field, and none of them had heard of this ritual. Yes, um, and and in fact, it is important, and I. I I give it enormous importance because I actually devote three chapters of the book. <laughs> One about where, where on earth does it come from? Another is well, what is it? And yeah. third, what does it mean? Yeah. Um, and and yet, at the end of the day, I feel a certain irony um, <laughs> in that that people. I know that there are people who will hang on to the on to ritual. They they want something. Concrete. It, it, it's um, it's almost as if sort of it, it, it's like the student who goes to the library, takes out the books, and then feels they can relax and not have to write their essay <laughs> <laughs> for the next few weeks. Um, that, that there's something sort of special about that ritual. Whereas, uh, as as you were saying earlier on, one of the the aspects of the regency was that the, the ritual was sort of. And, and in Ron's terms, grew out, grew out of the ground. Um, it worked within a certain framework, yes. but it was entirely flexible. Whereas here was a very, very fixed ritual, which in fact was repeated um, in all of the coven's meetings. Yes. Um, now, <laughs> Robert Cochran, uh, <laughs> he he explains them as. Uh, on the one hand, drawing Kundalini from the base hat chakra to the crown chakra, and on the other, as drawing Kundalini from the crown to the base chakra. Uh, I, as far as I can remember, in in uh, a correspondence with Bill Gray, uh, Bill Gray, who's a Kabbalistic uh, magician, talks yeah. about um, a ritual of the sword as as bringing. As, as you're drawing Kundalini uh, down from the crown to the base and so the broom is seen as, as symbolic of drawing Kundalini from the base to the crown um, so for Cochrane the process of drawing Kundalini up and down the chakra created the bridge or the entrance to the other world as a person who has I've had mystical experiences since I was a child, so I can identify in a sense of what he's describing, and I think that that what what he's doing is drawing on yogic and kabbalistic sort of systems of thought purely to express a process in witchcraft which is non-verbal. Um, that he's actually not drawing on these systems at all, um, except as a way of explaining a process that's going on um, within himself. Um, I know that as a young man I had great difficulty <coughs> understanding the discipline that was considered necessary for losing myself or my selfhood um, because for me that was just about stepping sideways through a door. It didn't require any training or effort and I think that we have to remember that the members of the Covenant and the Regency were mystics or are mystics, um, and that's where they begin uh, their ritual, and shamanic ritual gives depth and direction to that, and the bridge is the kind of crossing point, um, and, and again, they're just simply symbols, um, it's a movement into the other world, and the bridge was symbolized by crossing the broom and the sword. Uh, I suppose all I can really say with apology is, is, is 
to use sort of a, a twist, a slight twist on, on the words of the Tao Te Ching, which is to say the way is the, the way cannot be spoken of. Um, it, it, it's very difficult to explain what these are. Um, but at the end of the day, the broom and sword are no more than symbols. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's interesting that Hans Holzer later on um, experiences or witnesses yes. this with the broad broom and sword. Yes, yeah. Well, there is, I'm trying desperately to find in your text, but I think that it's, um, it's somewhere here, that um, words do not suffice to describe this kind of uh, experiences. There are, ex there are profound spiritual experiences that you can't really, I think that it was, um, that it's, I know that it's in your text and I, I, I will find it, but um, it, it's just impossible. You can't just say, okay, um, you, can, you can say how you, you know, you can point it out, the starting point. And you can point it out the the end. You can say, you know, you will attain attain. This is what you would attain in the end, or this is what you would be preferably attain in the end. But you can't you can't explain the experience itself. It's absolutely out of <laughs> words. <laughs> cannot do justice to that. And it's you know, and I and I think. This is what you said when you said, you know, power, power. If it doesn't have power, it's just the the relics, right? Um, and, and if you think about the relic, what is a relic? I mean, a relic is something that was sacred some, some, somehow, right? But it's inert. It's absolutely yes. stale. And, and you can't really do anything with it because it's just there. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you have to live it, and you have to experience these things. And then again, it's very, very difficult to talk about it in words and describe what it is. Um, I completely <coughs> understand. <laughs> so why is the full right of initiation, which it's it's called the full right of initiation, um, important in terms of the history of this group? It's important, I suppose, because it it shows this very uneasy power struggle uh, that was going on within the coven and how that power struggle got resolved. For George and Ron, leadership of the coven was a role. It wasn't anything more than that. Um, for them, and this is to sort of paraphrase Ron la writing later on, there was no one of sufficient spiritual power to lead the witch. No one was a god or goddess with the right to rule, the witch was essentially self-determining. Um, every witch had his or her own path. Uh, whereas for Robert Cochrane, leadership had other meaning for it. It was it, uh, there was a sense of personal power, um, and in the draft right, uh, the draft of this right, he attempts to institutionalise power in the coven uh, in the magister and the high priestess well he happened to be the magister and the high priestess was his wife Jane um, and it's if it's difficult uh, the 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 whole process of of releasing the articles and and then the book um, was to defend people who could not defend themselves because they were no longer there to do so, um, and and so it's very difficult to to speak of of Roy Bowers or Robert Cochran. But but if you look at his letter, it does seem that he almost boasts about um, how he's institutionalised the power in one of his letters to to Ron White. Um, so I, I think I think that was a failure to to really appreciate. Uh, where Ron and George were coming from and the nature of the people they were um, because um, they were strongly opposed to that institutionalization and, and whilst Ron um, never says anything negative um, about uh, Robert Cochran 
Um, he does at some point talk about sort of he's got no more time for the peccadilloes of leaders and I'm sure that's a direct reference <laughs> um, <laughs> even if Cochrane isn't named and so what happens is that George and Ron um, edit this uh, draft right of initiation very heavily um, to produce the final right of initiation and the What's also important about that right of initiation is that, that the compromise of it all is that the group shares ideas. Um, and they felt, both Ron and George certainly felt that the sharing of ideas was an essential aspect of witchcraft itself. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's somewhat ironic that the ideas should then all have become part of what was called the Cochrane tradition and credited to Robert Cochrane, but <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the full factor is always there. But the thing is that that's why Regency comes Regency. You know, the name, it's exactly why, you know, it's a group of people. It's not, there is no name to it. And by the way, I think, and you can uh, confirm or, or, um, or not this, but I think that it was uh, Robert who actually called the Gardnerians Gardnerians. The name uh, came about, apparently, right? <laughs> yes, uh, J Jane makes reference to this. And, yes. and uh, in the um, Pentagram magazines, uh, someone makes complaint also about how uh, this word Gardnerian at the time is used as a derogatory or an implicitly derogatory term. So, um, And it's also underlies the falling out with uh, Robert Cochran and Doreen Valiente because she was coming from the, that Gardnerian tradition, Gardnerian without any implicit put down, that is. Yes, yeah. Um, now, one of the things that I wanted to, to tell, um, you know, I, we're going to talk about it a little bit more, but um, the rights, you write on your text, this is a text that you wrote, um, it's called uh, The Regency and the Cochrane Coven by John Monmouth. Um, you actually say uh, the rites of the Regency also um, start, each, each rite start, um, in its start, use the maze walking, circling, drumming, stamping, chanting, meditation on the mysteries, solemnly, fear of the unknown, and transformation of the landscape to disorient its attenders and produce in them an altered state of consciousness that would lead them into the other world of the gods and the gods. On occasion, they would also use magic to bring the dead to their celebrations or to surround their celebrations with mist. This is what you wrote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's you outline here what, what the Regency does. I mean, pro, you yeah. know, prob that's exactly, you know. Um, yeah. So all of this, so maze, make, uh, maze walking, circling, drumming, stem, I mean, there is this effort to take us out into an altered state of mind, of consciousness. And this is what you called stepping into the other world, where you can actually meet with the godhead, I mean, the, you know, the goddesses and, and the gods. And this is the only, the, the only possible way um, that, you know, the Regency feels that this is the, this is the way that it works um, for, for you. Now, you said that you would use magic uh, to bring the dead, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Halloween, and, and there's this kind of thing, how come that, you know, these people of, tra I, I've heard this, these people of traditional witchcraft, that's what they call you, just in case you don't know, John. <laughs> <laughs> these people of traditional witchcraft call their things Halloween. What do you mean Halloween? Halloween is an American thing. It's not really, and um, you know we have to tell them that really you know this is just part of the evolution of the thing, you know, of the names of the Sabbaths and you know of of the festivities that you had uh, that you choose not to call them by the Celtic names but by some other names that are a little bit more. And this takes us into the evolution of of all of this into something that. Um, 
uh, it's a little bit more close to us and not that archaic. Away from the relic. That's what we want to be. <laughs> now, yes. <laughs> now, um, there is a system that I'm very curious about, and this is absolutely... It, when I read about it, I was fascinating. It was fascinating to me because it was... You know, people say that magi musicians or artists in general are geniuses. Um, they can access um, uh, very easily uh, the other world. It's very easy for them uh, to get in trance. To I mean, you, did you ever look at a pianist at the piano in the middle of a concert? I mean, they're absolutely off. They're not there at all. Um, so this is exactly what, what happened. And this system... It's very interesting. It's it's called the swing system, and it was born out of actually the knowledge of a musician. A musician. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, yes. No, so, uh, <laughs> the, the all of the techniques, the maze dancing, the, all of this um, work for us. It, it may not be the only means of, of achieving these things. Um, and within the coven, and there was an actual role for the musician. Um, and George was the jazz trumpeter, so so he, at some level, was the source of this. As you say, music has the capacity to um, affect us. Um, to resonate uh, within us and, and and change our change our state of consciousness, we can become quite enwrapped um, by watching a musician, by listening to the music, and the swing system um, means that you, you have two beats going on at the same time, one which is twice as fast as the other, um, and. It doesn't have to be simply music. It, it, it can be people making sounds. It can be um, the stamping of feet. Um, so all of, so uh, and that is that has an effect on one's consciousness. Um, very very difficult to describe. I had to to, to <laughs> discuss. Again. Yes. Uh, again, in my acknowledgments, you see that I actually had to refer to a musician <laughs> to actually make sense, some sense of this myself. Um, yeah. Because again, it's 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 about terminology yeah. um, being used to describe experiences and and and, and the events that went on. It, it's it's back to mumbling and stumbling, really. Um, all I can really say is that, that when you take all of these sort of uh, means of altering consciousness together along with um, and, and in particular with the use of sort of very primitive symbols, archetypes um, then then you arrive at this other world um, I, I, don't, I don't feel I've satisfactorily answered your question I don't know if you want to put this <laughs> no. <it> another way <laughs> No, you know, John, I just, I was, in the other day, I was looking at ancient Greek dances, you know, traditional, yes. you know, and, and then it led me into the Omer, uh, Omeric cadency of the verses that they would have, and then there was this group doing a dance, and at the same time there was this ancient, uh, this, this man was reciting the uh, Iliad, I think, in at the same pace, so they were they were beating the pace. The dancers were beating the pace at the same time as he was reciting it in ancient Greek, and it was amazing to me. I mean, you know, all of these dances. It's just if you are, if you really are aware, if you really are 
um, you you can look at these things and and kind of understand them. But you you know that when you're experiencing them, you can't really tell in words. There's no no. I'm not doing a better job than you, John. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really. But we right. we can just say that you know it's 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 really a cadency. It's it's um it's losing yourself in the rhythm it's it's going beyond i mean at a certain point you're not you're not listening to it anymore i mean you're just you you just passed and then yes. that's what you feel um <laughs> it's more than that but we can't really describe yeah, it the the other... save me there so i, I agree <laughs> <laughs> so um the other thing is is um uh, th there is something that Roy said um, that I find it very, very interesting. He said, the genuine mysteries are open to all. What did he mean by this? It, he, was, he was speaking of this in terms of um, people who set themselves up as um, gateways to the mysteries. Um, uh, he, he saw people as uh, charlatans, I suppose, um, if they um, had a mystery. Um, the mysteries are open to all because there is... They are... I think we'll have to come back to this. I think we'll have to come back to this. Right? <laughs> okay. yeah, a mystery is a mystery. <laughs> At the end of the day, a mystery is a mystery. Um, how does yes. one understand a mystery? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, to, to, ex to, to experience, if we, ta if we take some of those mysteries, like life and death, sex, mm. those sorts of things, they are open to us all. Uh, mm. um, there is no no secret sort of route to these things. There's there's there's, there's nothing you have to pay in order to um, participate in mysteries, experience mysteries. Um, it, everyone can experience them. Is that what you're trying to say? What everyone. he meant, he meant that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> It's, it's, it's again. It's it's about sort of um, people claiming spiritual authority and and yes. why the regency was called the regency. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yes. That, that that central to it is the idea that we have equality upon a spiritual path, mm -hmm. and that's why we don't have spiritual leaders. We lead ourselves. Um, I while I'm the current leader of the Regency, I, I'm not its leader or its magister or its high priest, it's a role of organisational convenience rather than a title. Mm -hmm. And the idea that a power has an existence independent of the person, time or place and can be passed on um, would be humbug, I suppose, to, <laughs> to, to members in the Regency. <laughs> oh, someone is uh, calling you. I think so. I think, <laughs> As, as a region, we're all aware of the world that we enter, and it's a world that can only produce humility, because that's what my mystery does to one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I know that Roy was... Uh, uh, it, it, this is very interesting, because, you know, you have, uh, you have a lot of... Um, this man was absolutely amazing. I, I, I mean, I, I think that he was uh, absolutely brilliant. Ron, Ron was. I don't even have words to describe him. He was. He said various things. I mean, one of the first things that he said, or one of the things that he said that I have to say this, and you actually uh, quoted him on your text, is um, he said, "The simpler the understanding, the deeper the truth." And then he says, it is the moment of communication with oneself under the trees that counts. And then he says, it is the atmosphere of sincere worship and sullen joy that sinks deep into the heart. This was said and by Ron White. And, and um, 
it's it's just so simple, isn't it? But it's ultimately true. I mean, and I, <laughs> uh, well, I'm an Alexandrian high priest, so, I, you know, there's a lot of things that we have in Wicca that contain also this understanding. But Ron just said it so beautifully, you know. We have other means to say that, but it's the same thing. I mean, what really counts is that moment of communication within, you know, with under the trees, and and that the simplest, the simplest understanding is is really the deep, the, the deep truth. And people kind of go on and on. I mean, we talked about mysteries and. Yeah, we all can experience mysteries, but um, understanding those, it's a little bit more, dif it's different, it's not, not everybody, but it's not because they can't, it's because they complicate things. <laughs> it's okay. more simple, you know, <laughs> than... Is, you know. is, is it that you can experience a mystery, but you simply yeah. can't grasp it? No. <laughs> No, exactly. So it's it's absolutely beautiful when he says this, and when you, you know, and and so this is this is an evolution. He, you wrote in your text that uh, the regency demonstrates this evolution. Um, you know, he you said that Ron said that he wrote that that uh, there's the of of the need of the craft to recover from profound secrets hidden in fossilized fossilized superstition traditions that relics that, that relics that we talked about and to evolve into society um you can see that still today i mean is the regency still going and evolving its members are <laughs> 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 um, Yes, I, I, I think when I when I, I said that uh, I'm probably a witch and that uh, <laughs> I was would would have to wait till the end of my lifetime to find that out. I, th I, I think it's it's a process in, that continues to evolve within us, um, and we find that when we meet one another and we meet up. Um, our last meeting was was in fact to say farewell to to to, to one of uh, the people that we spent a lot of time with in the woods, um, and and so so we we exist um, as a group, but not uh, with any regular meetings. Um, we we are all very much um, filled with what was started in those woods back in the. In the sixties, um, I, th I think that in my book, I, I this, uh, beneath the sort of dedication of the book is is a quote from uh, Lynn. Um, we were privileged to learn the essence of the ancient craft with none of the nonsense. Um, so I, th I think that uh, when we meet up, um, we've we've each travelled further along our own paths and uh, yet we still come together and, and come together um, with a more grouped mind than ever um, so so we do exist and, and uh, as I say with we've, we've talked about um, whether we should pass what we have on, um, it may be that, 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 that what we've been prompted to do um, in the last few years with these sort of with the articles and the like um, will be sufficient. Maybe that that's where it, it, it will end, or at least we'll take off again. Um, whether I, I know that for my own part, um, I did. Uh, attempt to lead a, a, a group, um, a new group of people um, that uh, found that uh, ideas from other cultures um, interfered 
really with with what was going on so that that within the context of if if one reads about the regency ceremonies in the context of of the goddess and the gods of the, of the woodlands as they're understood say in, in England um, the an invocation of the buffalo goddess is slightly out of place and and uh, doesn't let one I suppose move to where one wants to go um, we've remained happy as we are and then now that makes um, that makes me think about another thing, it, uh, which is I always have a difficult question for the guest. I think that this is yours, John. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you talked about you know this is a very individual path, and at the same time, a group. I mean, it's very difficult to define this. I mean, I, I, I really know what you're going through when you kind of have to talk about these things. But the thing is that if someone in, let's just say, in, um, I don't know, in um, Brazil, for instance, yeah. okay, want to follow this path and, you know, and uh, do their own thing, I mean, do you think that it is possible to to do this in Brazil. You talked about, you know, the Buffalo Goddess, and, you know, obviously it's misplaced because we talked about we're, we're working the land, we're working in the land with the land's energies and, you know, and all of it is connected with the land deeply. Um, but uh, do, is it possible to do this in Brazil? I, I think you've just answered answered your own question. Um, I think so. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I was very aware of, uh, and uh, uh, one of the people that I'd consulted with, um, because of his extensive knowledge of witchcraft, he had he had a very strong interest in the Regency, and he he actually made a pilgrimage to Queen, Queen's Wood um, and brought back photographs of it for me, and. Uh, it made me aware that the one thing element that I'd left out of the book was genus loci, the spirit of place, Absolutely. and how that spirit of place can can affect you. I think I, I recently went up to Mid Wales and went to a wood that had the same spirit as Queen's Wood, um, and I and so so the, so it's, it's straightforward. It, you work with the spirit of that place, whether you're in Brazil or whatever. Um, and um, my my own wife is from the Caribbean, um, and she has no difficulty um, operating with the spirits of the place in this country, or, or, in, or any other part of the world, I would assume. Um, yes, no reason at all. So, so I do think, in a way, you, you helpfully answered your own difficult question. This is this is very interesting because um uh yeah, it backfired to me. Uh thank you, John. <laughs> the, the, one of the things that it's very interesting is that I come um you know, I'm I'm originally from Portugal and I come from uh, a little uh, city in Portugal that is um, a Templar city and in the castle of the Templar city there is uh, one uh, little <laughs> um, stone that they didn't touch um, the Templars I mean and it was left there by the Romans and it just has two words in it Ginny Long Guy <laughs> and <laughs> Nobody touches the stone because they don't know what it is. So the Templars thought, okay, let's just build the wall around it of the castle. So you have the castle wall, and there's this huge stone that it's part of the castle wall that it says Ginny Lokai, which is amazing. It was just, uh, uh, you know, so... I guess that if you go to Portugal in that particular um, city, you know where to worship it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very easy. It says in the you know in the stone. So uh, <laughs> um, then there is another thing that I wanted to talk about, which is um, to me it's very important. Also, uh, is the uh, simplicity, and and. Uh, 
this is another thing that we talked about this before. I mean, simple, simple. You know, I think that it was Ron who said the simple, the simple, the understanding, the deep of the truth. And then he says, you know, further on, he says, simplicity is at the heart of the Regency, and this was in the t at the time that was founded. I, I would guess, right? Its ceremonies are public. A sincere belief is all that is required. There is no oath, no membership fee, no initiation. The rites are simple, direct, childlike. The myth is told over and acted out. Each attender can read its significance for, of, uh, for himself, whether at a simple or more esoteric level. So this is all, go it all goes back to the participant. Um, I know now that it's not public because you said to us, you know, this evolved into another thing. I mean, now it's really not public, but um, it's the, the simplicity of this and how he describes this. It's absolutely amazing. Did you know uh, Ron? You, kn you knew Ron? Oh, yes. yes how, how was he? I mean, this man is amazing. How was he? Can you tell us a little bit more about Ron? I mean, we're, we're, we're reading Ron's words, but we wanted to know about Ron. How was it to have a conversation with him? How was it to sit with him? Ron was a man of great fun, um, highly mischievous. Um, <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> a, a very strong liking for um, big language in spite of his use of simplicity. Um, It's, it's, it is very difficult to describe the, the, the people you live with and loved. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. For, for me, sort of, he, you know, I, I, I was considerably younger than him, uh, and uh, I know that sort of it, it did come as an enormous surprise to me when he sort of passed leadership of the Regency. <laughs> over to me um, and I <coughs> what he'd said about uh, passing leadership over and the qualities that he he was looking for I, I hope that I would eventually achieve um, I, d I, I didn't hero worship him in any way I, I, I I'm very much sort of um, against any notion of the cult of the personality. Uh, I, I believe in equality. Um, just a lovely man to be around and, and always great fun. Um, very creative. Um, his sculptures and his paintings um, uh, I still um, see regularly. Um, now, are we, are we looking... Are we looking... F are we looking at... I don't know. I'm just guessing. I don't know. I didn't even look at the. Uh, but I was looking uh, on the cover of the book. I was looking at one of Ron's um, sculptures. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yes. I, yes. I would. I would imagine. Um, yeah. So the, the 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 cover of the book has uh, a sculpture of uh, of Ron. Ron. Yes. White. And she's in fact looking down at me at this very moment. <laughs> so. <she laughs> She's in this room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's lovely, lovely. Um, and, and this, the skull is Lizzie. Um, oh, really? Oh, it is, has a uh, name. Part, oh. part of, uh, you the, still have it, obviously. Halloween. Yes. Yeah, which, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, the purpose of the rites, again, um, there is an article of Ron. <laughs> <laughs> that describes this, and you write it on your article. Uh, in worshipping the gods, he says, we identify ourselves with the process of which we are a part. We cannot, outside the mystic communion, ever fully comprehend that process, and in that understanding, we may gain is ultimately unexplicable. The written word is, un uh, is useless to describe a full experience 
Thanks, Ron. We know that <laughs> by now. <laughs> Very good. The notion of pros uh, progress as against this pros process is il illus illusory, 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 illusory. By following the path of the gods throughout the year, and we're talking about the seasons. You have an article on this particular um, website about this. You know all of the festivals and its purpose. It's called the meditations, right? Um, yeah. the f by following the path of the gods through the, throughout the year, we may come closer to the real know knowing, which is of the heart and distinct from knowing about. So this knocks out all of the intellectuals of the craft right away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Right away, just shut up, all right? And then uh, you have to follow the path of the gods through the air and know this within your heart. So this is the true way of, of um, you know, it's, it's a sincere, and it's all, again, you know, going back to the individual. It is your experience. It is how, it, you know, there is a mechanic, there is a um, trigger, there is a technique that might be used to do this, but this is always your own experience that then will obviously, um, um, will, um, be contagious to the group and the, and then the group soul and the group mind and and all of that um but it's it's absolutely it's, it's just i don't know this man i think that it's just he just explains it so beautifully and simply that it's absolutely amazing to me <laughs> he was an artist there you go he see an artist and a yeah poet. yeah yeah that's that's the purpose of the rides that right there now um, what is the essence of the Regency? You, you talked about this and you write about this, uh, not only in the book, but also in this article that you have here. Um, what do you think that it's really the essence of the Regency? In terms of rights, I mean, it, in terms of the right itself and how things work and, you know. Beauty and mystery. And I think again back to Hans Holzer and when he came to London and uh, <laughs> he witnessed this uh, event with the broom and the sword um, and he describes how the, the the women are have periwinkle this this purple flower um, and there's a beauty to it and there's a mystery to all that goes on there and I think that beauty and mystery um, are, are the essence and, and that beauty and mystery are also that greater truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is another piece that um, you wrote here and, and, and I think that this is you, this is not um, I don't think that this is uh, Ron at all. This is you. You says you say that the aim of the new mystery religion was to experience truth, wisdom, through mystical communion. This experience of truth, however, is transitory, existing in the moment alone. So it's ephemeris, basically. That's what yes. he's trying to say. To maintain and develop awareness of the truth the mystical experience has to be repeated again and again. This is where the seasonal celebrations come into play, legend, rituals, and myths. Um, and, 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 you know, and then this is what Robert Cochran writes, legend, rituals, and myths are the roads through many layers of consciousness to the area of the mind where the soul can exist in its totality. And this is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, this imagery is amazing. And it's really what um, <laughs> I think, you know, I never had words to describe some of the things that sometimes I feel, <laughs> you know, on the rituals, on when you do ritual or whatever. And this is absolutely in on the, on the, on the spot. I mean, it's on the, you know, it's really nailing it. Um, it you know, th when we do, when we talk about repeating over and over again, are the festivals, um, 
you know, all of this, these meditations that you wrote about, actually, in the, in the... What do you feel about the perception of this when other people practice, I mean, outside of regens, regency? Do you have any idea what, what other people do, and do you have any opinion about what, what people do outside of regency? And, and how does that, I mean, what... I mean, obviously you're going to say, oh, well, m mine is better, or mine... It's not about better, but how do you feel that the interpretation of this tools, because, you know, the, the wheel of the year, it's basically a tool, a tool to attain and to repeat, as they say here. And you, you said it, you know, uh, this to, to aware, the awareness of truth, uh, the mystical experience has to be repeated again and again, and that's through the, the will of the air, you know, that, that repeating those rituals. What do you think that it's the perception of the outsider? I mean, what, what, what do you think that they do? Do you think that they really are having this experience and, and this consciousness of, of repeating it to know that, you know, to have this mystical experience? To, I find it, if you I, ask me, this is my opinion. I don't, I don't think... I ahead. don't know. I don't know. However, um, I... I I have had several people um, make reference to um, either having um, attended one or two group, meetings yeah. of the region to see, um, or having attended a meeting um, led by a regency member, um, and in each case they, they've made similar statements to those that were made by Doreen, Bill, and Marion, that, that there was something quite other about <laughs> the ritual. So, so all I can conclude from that is that that some people certainly um, feel the difference. Are not doing what we're doing. Yes, <laughs> that's, a, that's a marvelous um, way of putting it. Very politically correct, John. But it really is. It it's exactly what. Yeah, that's what it is. You, they are not certainly do what you're doing. <laughs> For them to perceive that that way. Um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I always felt that there was always in you know, and I'm I might come across as a little bit of a snob, maybe. Um, but um, there are places and practices that there are true power working, meaning, you know, true awareness, um, true mystical experience that certainly not exist in others. And that is why people can see that when in the presence of those authentic and let's use the word that you use in the title of your book, genuine, um, practices are in place. So when they go to them, they actually um, are blown away. And, and they do feel the difference. They absolutely do. And um, so, yeah, so we're not saying that other people don't, but <laughs> we're just saying that there is a difference. Okay. Um, so, uh, would, go ahead. What I would say for a moment, though, is <laughs> yes. that, that the title of the book... Yes. Genuine Witchcraft is Explained is simply a play on Robert Cochran's first article which was titled Genuine Witchcraft is Defended <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's in no way a claim of this genuine witchcraft <laughs> what I would say though is that um, since writing that book I've tried to address that problem of the absence of the genus loci and have written an article which is coming out in Pentacle 37, oh. uh, which questions or raises issues about what is the nature of witchcraft if it if it really is a tradition. Um, and I, th as I think at some level, sort of simplicity has to be part of it. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that make me th that you know you you now make me think about it really. Um, yeah. If we look at what you do, and we have very little knowledge of what you do, John, but, you know, the things that you wrote, <laughs> according to what you wrote and according to what the things you, you, you said to us, um, it's very individualistic, isn't it? I mean, obviously it has the group in it and the experience of the group, and there is a procedure. Um, but the results sometimes are ch change. They change. And even the rituals change. 
you know, because we are people experience them. And sometimes they change, they have to change. Um, because either people are not in the same level at that point that they were last year, so now we're experiencing it differently and we have to change it a little bit. So they do evolve as people evolve. They have to go through all of the, you know, they have to um, follow, you know, um, the evolution of the spirit of man. I don't think that they should be, you know, and a tradition is by definition something that you would repeat over and over again the same way. Um, I don't think, by reading what I read here, that the practices of the Regency or anything else that Rond wrote about is um, stagnant at all. In, uh, on the contrary, they're very dynamic and they accompany the evolution of uh, the human soul. Do you, do you, un do you agree with this? I, th I think so. I think that, that sort of that we that there is a common path that, that, that yes. unites and focuses people. That there is an evolving common theme that's set by the seasons. That that. Uh, we don't deal with circles, we deal with spirals, and so things necessarily move onwards um, and, and carry forward. Um, everything gets carried forward, but it gets shaped as we, we, we travel along. I think that's, that's how it, it has to be. Um, who I was last Lammas is not going to be no. the same as I'm going to be next Lammas. Um, yeah. It's going to have a different, slightly different meaning to me. Um, yeah. It's still going to have a, something of the core of its meaning to me, but it will be more developed. Um, really, that simple, I suppose. <laughs> now, do you do you feel that because the members are so organic in the way they experience this, and you know, it's an individual experience? Do you think that because you are part of a group? and this is a group experience also, that they do adjust very well to the differences and evolutions of each of the, of the individuals, or they kind of kind of, ooh, what, what was that? What, what did John did now? <laughs> he never did this before. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So uh, 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 is it a, a symbiotic kind of thing? Everyone goes with the flow and it's f fantastic, or, or do you feel this? Yes, I, th I think I think that's yeah. that's the case. It's, it, there's a gel. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone mm -hmm. just go with mm -hmm. the flow. It's, it's fantastic. I think that you know, if if um, if one just pursues one's own individual path, I mean, and I think this is part of the reason for coming together. You end up in some cranky place. Um, coming together, sort of, um, is for us is essential. It's also essential if one one can't evolve in in isolation. You, you have to have something to evolve with. Why else change if uh, if the rest isn't changing? I think that your change would be bigger or better if you are changing with others. The change of the other, this is my perception, the change of the other will enhance your own um, in some way. <laughs> I, you know? I, 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 I agree with you. I, I think I, I was just, um, again, uh, talk, <laughs> talking to my wife yesterday um, uh, and uh, about sort of the idea that when I met her, she was coming up to the age of 18 um, this is uh, we've been together 30 odd years um, but I, I still see her very much as the girl she was yes. uh, and that's the eternal in her whilst the rest changes on that on that sort of form um, so I think in a way although we evolve um, there is something eternal going on as well, which which holds that evolution. And I think, um, you know, when we when we talk about uh, and we did about the 
child childlike um, I, I don't remember what it was, but it was uh, I think it was uh, Ron that said a childlike uh, experience. Um, it has to do with that also. Um, it has to do with uh, that spontaneity and that belief, that faith, that um, you know that that openness, that that I don't care if I'm blindfolded. I can die now and I will be happy. <laughs> You know what I mean? That yeah. surrender, um, that not really be, I mean, that, that childlike putting your fingers into the socket like, um, I don't, you know, let, let me just experience it and be fully aware of the consequences of it. I don't, I don't, I really do care, but I, I, I have this ability to actually go and just step forward and it doesn't really matter. Um, because I do believe it, so I think that that's also part of it. What are you talking if, about? If, I mean, the if, believing. Uh, and... Yes, if yeah. if uh, if the mysteries are open to everyone, then then childlike simplicity is is the only route, surely. Absolutely, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, John and Monmouth, uh, the book is "Genuine Witchcraft Is Explained: uh, The Secret History of the Royal Windsor Coven and the Regency." John, thank you so, so much for being on Witch Talk and to actually share with us your, um, your wisdom and your history and your life, because this is your life. <laughs> Indeed, yes, yes. <laughs> I've greatly enjoyed, greatly enjoyed our conversation and if I, um, I've stumbled and mumbled my way through it, but uh, anyway, that's, that's dotage, is it? <laughs> exactly. No, you didn't. Uh, don't go anywhere, John. I will talk to you in a few seconds. I'm just going to close the show and then I will uh, talk to you, okay? Thank right. you so much. Thank you so much for being on Witch Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it. Uh, that is the end of our show today. A uh, uh, show with uh, John about his book um, go to the website and uh, the website um, is uh, wonderful he has a lot of uh, texts for you and if you want the book is um, available to you uh, through Caliban so Ronald, Ronald Chalky White dot org dot uk don't forget about the dot org dot uk will be where you will read uh, some of the texts that are in the book and then fortunately you will uh, have uh, the book for you uh, it's a very very good book I would recommend it very very much so um, next week I'll be back with more Witch Talk